Hello, everyone. Hi, Hello. folks. Is everybody drunk enough yet, or are you guys still uh, taking it slow? Good. I like that. I like that. Sweet. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Shit, man. Yes. Is, you have down. Thank you. Let's get one of those. I love that idea. All right, folks. So today we're going to talk about uh, war driving, the public safety band. Uh, so has anybody heard of the public safety band before the public safety? Yes. Good. How many people are ham operators? Ham? Yeah. Good. Sweet. Do you guys know about 4.9 gigahertz? Some, yes, yeah, some not. Okay, good. So some of this uh, might be a little bit of, I love you so much. Great. You're the man. Thank you, sir. Cheers to Freak Nick. Freak, to Freak Nick. Nick. <laughs> all right. So, uh, yeah, public safety spectrum has been around for a little bit, uh, but we're going to cover all the new shit. Uh, by new, I mean in the last 10 years. <laughs> So there's going to be some changes, uh, but you might know some of it. And uh, we did dug a little bit into 4.9 gigahertz, and we'll show you what we found uh, there. Uh, real quick, my name is Brad Antonowitz. I work at Foundstone as part of their open security research project, and that allows me to play around with a bunch of different stuff, kind of whatever I feel like. Um, and Rob uh, does a whole bunch of wireless stuff, and he basically was like, hey, man, I heard there's this 4.9 gigahertz shit. Uh, tell us about it. And so. Uh, he told me about it, and uh, now we're here. That's it. It's the whole story. Sorry. More <laughs> or less. Yeah. And right. that's Rob. Hi. I'm Rob. Uh, I'm the uh, wireless service line leader at Foundstone. Uh, I teach the uh, wireless hacking class at Foundstone as well. And uh, uh, in my spare time and my uh, work time, I like to hack stuff. So I think very mo the, I, the, probably the first thing that we should say uh, before we really talk too much about this is we were starting to get really worried about kind of the legal uh, you know things with this uh, specifically like 4.9 gigahertz you need a FCC license to transmit in some of the areas and I don't really know about receive or any of that stuff and I was trying to look it up in the code of federal regulations and the Communications Act of 1934 and all this stuff, and it all just uh, was kind of complicated to me. So before you guys do anything, uh, just proceed with caution. Uh, you know, I really don't know the, the legalities of any of this stuff. Um, you know, so, be careful. So uh, before we give this talk at DEF CON, um, the EFF was nice enough to kind of counsel us on it, and their take on it was pretty much uh, as long as you're passively monitoring the networks, that is not interacting with them in any way of uh, sending uh, traffic or purposely trying to access them, uh, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, and as long as you're approaching it from the uh, standpoint of not being malicious. so Yeah, just don't be a dick. Be careful. Basically. Uh, all right, so today we'll talk about public safety, a couple of spectrum uh, allocations, and then we'll take a focus on 4.9 gigahertz and talk about uh, some of the things that we saw there and how uh, uh, you can look around too if you have an SCC license, I guess. Um, so the public safety spectrum is actually, uh, has been around for quite a while now. Uh, it's basically um, a couple of different allocations that the FCC has made um, for the sole purpose of, uh, of to protect the safety of life, health, or property. So uh, that's kind of a very broad statement, but basically it's a reserved area that uh, you know government can use that doesn't have to worry about getting interference from any other th different areas. Um, it comprises of actually a couple of different uh, you know uh, areas of the spectrum, and the ones that we'll briefly talk uh, talk on um, are out here. So this is the radio spectrum. Um, the relatively new shit uh, is what we'll be looking at, and, and it has color that's not gray. Um, and so we'll be talking about the 700 megahertz, 800 megahertz, focusing on 4.9 gigahertz, and then we'll also briefly look at uh, 5.9 gigahertz. The, 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 ponies are everywhere, man. Ponies are everywhere. The ponies, are, the ponies are coming. Actually, actually, yeah, we are. We'll we have a, we have a pony. You we'll like it? Pony. Not the kind. Uh, so, uh, so first up is 700 megahertz. So, um, actually, if you guys remember, there's this whole digital TV cutover, and that big digital TV cutover optimized the spectrum a little bit and freed up um, the upper uh, D block of um, of the spectrum in 700 megahertz. So the FCC said, "All right, well, we'll use that. Uh, we'll reallocate it." Uh, to, um, to, to public safety, and we'll actually uh, subdivide it a little bit into broadband and narrowband areas, um, and so kind of people can use it. Uh, the big thing about it is it's going to be nationwide, so a lot of people are, a lot of state and local uh, municipalities are really interested in it, um, and it has a lot of big potential. Ponies. There's the pony. <laughs> so, uh, 
So the broadband network is what everyone's really, really excited about. So this is a broadband LTE network. Um, so the idea behind it is it's going to be, you know, it's actually outsourced to a bunch of, um, to, you know, a big so, telecom provider and stuff. So there's a, uh, uh, the MPSTSC, the National Public Safety uh, Telecommunications uh, Council, and uh, they're, they're overseeing it. It's going to be done under this uh, blanket or organization known as FirstNet. Uh, basically, the long and short of it is they're in the planning stages of ro rolling this thing out now, and uh, at the rate they're going, it should probably be done sometime in 2075. Um, yeah, but there's slow, actually but some small spots that are using well, little te there's, test there's, areas. There's been, it, you know? um, they've gotten variances or, or, uh, or, or um, they've gotten, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, permission to go ahead with their own test implementations, and there's a few of those going forward. Um, they just had the first meeting of FirstNet, so, uh, and, you know, basically it's in the planning stages. It's very early on. But when it does go forward, uh, it's going to be LTE, and it, it's what the, it's going to be a nationwide public safety um, broadband network, uh, and they're looking at that being the backbone of the public safety. Yeah, I mean, remember with this public safety stuff, a lot of it came out of 9-11 and Katrina and all this stuff. Um, there was all these kind of reviews that, that happened, uh, you know, uh, looking at, uh, how we responded to those major incidents, and it turned out that we didn't know how to communicate. A lot of people were using different radios, a lot of people were using different networks and stuff, and so a lot of the public safety stuff was to kind of unify everybody so that if there is a big emergency, uh, we can all communicate easily together, um, especially, you know, all the government. One more thing on that, too. Uh, in, in regards to the D-Block auction, which was at uh, 10 megahertz of space, uh, adjacent to the existing uh, uh, broadband uh, allocation, uh, part of that was if the uh, no providers actually bought that. None of the telecom providers bought that at auction. The idea was going to be if you bought it, there was a uh, condition that you would be uh, have to put money into um, helping develop this this nationwide broadband network. The theory is that nobody bought it based on that, and so that's been reconfigured in the way they're going to be doing it. Yeah, and then the narrow band portion of that 700 megahertz spectrum is all for P25. So some of you ham radio operators might, may have heard of P25. Um, it's just basically kind of a trunk radio system that you can kind of communicate back and forth with. Um, there's been some vulnerabilities found in it, uh, and it's being used by, I think, the FBI and Secret Service. I know I'm from uh, New York, and in New York, there's some very small usages of it. I, I don't know, uh, you know the, how it is used throughout other areas, but in New York, it's very, very minimal. So the, uh, the other public safety allocation is the 800 megahertz spectrum. And this kind of spectrum uh, was actually kind of, there's a bit of tension around this whole thing. Um, basically, it was initially uh, subdivided in a way where uh, there were some that was kind of for public safety, some was for uh, kind of SMR uh, radio usage, um, and then some of the stuff was kind of general usage. And the way they were, FCC was allocating licenses was kind of all over the spectrum. And so Nextel started to build out their network, and what happened was they would just go and buy up other people's license. And so they started to take over a lot of this spectrum. And uh, that was causing interference onto some of the areas that were a little bit more dedicated to, say, public safety. So the FCC got pissed about that, um, and they actually kicked out uh, Nextel out of the lower range of the block and told them to move all the way to the kind of the other side. They put in a guard band and kind of reconfigured it. So the, the reason that that was causing a lot of problems was that there was a uh, what's called a high side architecture and a low side architecture. And with the uh, public safety implementation we're using, it's called a high side architecture. Um, it's very, uh, you know, a few uh, or lesser amount of transmitters uh, on very high locations like tops of tall buildings, hilltops, stuff like that, very tall towers. Um, what Nextel was using for the ESMR is called a low side architecture, which is many more sites but on a much lower uh, uh, vertical plane, so like, you know, three-story buildings, uh, lower poles, things like that, and that just added to the problem. Um, so, uh, interestingly enough, I see now that the, well, when, they, when the um, uh, government uh, stuck, uh, basically told uh, Nextel that because of this, you're going to have to foot the bill for all this. Um, and that was before Sprint bought Nextel, and I don't know why Sprint would have bought Nextel with that uh, sort of uh, hammer hanging over their head. But at any rate, um, Nextel is now apparently going to be no more, and uh, as I uh, just read recently, uh, Sprint is now going to be taking the spectrum that they had from Nextel and using it for LTE now. So another interesting 
a turn of events. Yeah, and this 800 megahertz stuff is also going to be more uh, P25 voice. So, um, you know, there's a couple of allocations you'll see here that, that are all kind of for voice, specifically P25. And the reason why is P25 has some encryption capabilities to, to kind of secure the, the radio communications between uh, field operatives, and they don't have to worry about uh, maybe somebody being evil and, and trying to, to, to listen uh, while they're committing a crime or anything like that. Um, and so what we really, really care about is 4.9 gigahertz. We'll talk about the 5.9 briefly after this, but the most of this talk is going to be about 4.9 gigahertz. Um, basically, there was this need uh, that municipalities felt that they had where they needed high-speed data transfer. Um, and so 4.9 gigahertz was allocated for that. A lot of the stuff operates um, similar to the way 802.11 operates and kind of allows these, these quick uh, data transfers. Um, one of the specific uses uh, that people were kind of thinking about using 4.9 gigahertz for was like, you know, uh, on the scene uh, networks. So, you know, uh, an ambulance, a fire, uh, a fire truck, and a police, uh, you know, all come together at, on, a, on a scene and they need to communicate quickly uh, and transfer data. They can set up, a, you know, a mobile or a temporary uh, network and s establish that communication back and forth. But uh, when they allocated 4.9, nobody really said what exactly it was going to be for. So everybody, these municipalities, kind of all jumped aboard. They were like, yeah, we need this. You know, I, I'm not really sure what exactly it does, but we need it. They all got a bunch of licenses for it. And then they were like, all right, well, what do we use it for? And so what you find is that it's actually being used as a very uh, kind of general area for these kind of point-to-point -point connections some places. Um, the Republican uh, National uh, Convention and the, uh, the DNC and G20 Summit, they all used it uh, just for their Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, there's well, SCADA networks on there. There's all types of crazy So things. some of the, uh, yeah, I mean, so when they originally, uh, you know, implemented this, the original thought was it was going to be used for sort of like ad hoc networks at the uh, site of a uh, incident response, you know, things like accidents or more prolonged events such as protests or uh, hostage situations, you know, what have you. Um, what it ended up being is that you see it most primarily used now for like backhole point to point links uh, and surveillance cameras. Uh, you know, authorities love surveillance cameras and there's plenty of them. Uh, so you see it used for that quite a bit. Uh, it has been used in, su in such instances though, like, um, like uh, Brad was saying, the RNC and DNC in, in I believe uh, 2008 it was used. It was used at the G20 in, Prit in Pittsburgh um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but primarily you generally see it used for uh, things like, uh, you know, city, uh, you know, uh, or, um, um, permanently mounted uh, surveillance cameras. Yeah, but it's just kind of general use. It's, it's kind of strange on, on where, they're, where they're using it all. Um, so the way that the FCC started to regulate this a little bit was they said, all right, there's going to be uh, categories low power and high power. And if you're transmitting uh, you know, above 20 dB, uh, then you're considered a high power device, uh, and you have to follow some of these strict guidelines. But if you transmit lower than that, then you can kind of do whatever you want for the most part as far as how your channel layout's going to be um, and, and, and things like that. Um, so one of the important things they have to remember when looking at 4.9 gigahertz networks is it's kind of a problem to, to figure out what the channels that they're using and how big the channels are because um, they can be varying widths. With 802.11, we usually deal with 20 megahertz wide channels, um, but this, they can change it to anywhere between 1 megahertz to 10 megahertz to 40 megahertz. Yeah. It just depends yeah. on, uh, on how they want to do it. So for the high power devices, what they did was they said, okay, we're going to give you um, 10 1 megahertz wide channels split by 8 5 megahertz wide channels. And you can bond these any way that you want and make your channel configuration kind of any way you want that, that will suit your purpose. And that made um, you know, manufacturers like Motorola who wanted to do you know, their own kind of channel, that made them happy and, and all that kind of good stuff. So, well, the, so the general bonding is usually 5, 10, 15, or 20 megahertz wide channels. Uh, generally, you see 5, 10, 20 most commonly, with 10 being probably the most common out of those. Um, the uh, interesting thing about the, actually, we're probably going to talk about this in the next slide, right? The yeah, masks. sure. We'll All right. Jump right so, into it. so there's two. There was two. Um, it was kind of a conflict here between the vendors and the public safety uh, technology advocates. The uh, public safety personnel uh, wanted um, to be able to use commercial off-the-shelf equipment. Uh, you know, specifically like 802.11J standard, uh, which is the 4.9 gigahertz in Japan, um, utilizes 4.9 gigahertz spectrum uh, with a, a, a in the you know the, what would be kind of the Uni2 band, um, and with uh, 20 megahertz wide channels. 
Uh, so it wouldn't be too far of a stretch from that for manufacturers to make equipment for this that wouldn't be too difficult to utilize uh, and would keep costs down, which was their concern. The manufacturers, particularly Motorola, um, were looking to establish a niche market uh, wherein they would be able to provide this niche equipment right, uh, at, at exceptional prices, uh, which some of it is. Um, the compromise was that they uh, developed two masks. Um, and the, the two emissions masks, rather. One for low power devices below 20 dBi, and one uh, and, um, and a high power mask for um, uh, devices putting out more than 20 dBm. Yeah, so you um, can see, like, right, right in the graph, uh, graphic here, the outer line there is your standard 802.11 um, uh, emission mask. Um, and so that works fine for all low power devices. So if you have a standard 802.11 adapter that can somehow drop down to 4.9 gigahertz, you're cool. You can actually communicate uh, as long as you can deal with the different channel sizes and stuff, you can communicate without a problem. Um, but for higher power devices, uh, they elegantly cut off the emission mask. They, they made it just strict enough that it wouldn't work with standard 802.11 devices, and you'd have to get new hardware and stuff. And so it's kind of, it's kind of uh, interesting that, um, you know, there was a lot of kind of people were saying, uh, I guess Motorola was lobbying a lot about this, uh, particularly so they can kind of have this market for, to, to sell electronics. So uh, sort of in addition to this, um, you know, b besides the 802.11 standard, um, you also have manufacturers that utilize uh, other uh, proprietary um, uh, protocols within the space. So Motorola, Motorola for instance, uh, uses uh, MEA, which is uh, Mobility Enhanced Access, their proprietary protocol. Um, in New Jersey, uh, the, some of the uh, 4.9 gigahertz implementations on the parkway uh, utilize WiMAX. So it's all not, you know, 802.11 compliant or even close in some cases, unfortunately. All right, and then the last public safety all allotment that we'll look at before we start digging into um, kind of war driving the, the space is the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum. And this stuff is on my to-do list forever. It's really, really cool, um, interesting technology that they're putting in this area. Um, so 5.9 gigahertz deals with intelligent transportation systems. So these are basically um, cars can kind of talk in between cars. They can do something called platooning and gather a bunch of cars together to, go, to operate at higher speeds. Um, there's uh, things where chuck, uh, trucks have to go through way stations, so rather than to go through them, they can kind of wirelessly transmit their, their data. Uh, you can sense traffic uh, blockage or problems up ahead. It's really, really interesting stuff, and we actually gave this talk at, um, at DEF CON, and uh, somebody from the Department of Transportation in New York came up to us afterwards and said that they were, you know, really testing all of this stuff out throughout New York. So basically that said to me, like, hey, come check this stuff out. So there, uh, are, okay, uh, there out. are some test implementations of it. It is fairly new in terms of implementation. Uh, if you look at the licenses, uh, the FCC site, there's only about 130-something licenses uh, in the entire U.S. However, there's a test implementation on the New York State Thruway upstate, and there is one on the uh, LIE, Long Island Expressway, as well. Uh, and what they're testing basically there is... Um, uh, through voluntary usage, um, they put the um, a, a transmitter, uh, an onboard, it's known as an OBU, um, an onboard unit uh, in these trucks, and then they have a roadside unit, um, an RSU, uh, and the trucks will transmit information such as uh, the uh, the um, a, a bunch of information about the service record of the truck, the driver's driving record, uh, the information about the company, uh, and in some cases they'll do what's called uh, weigh in motion, where actually be able to weigh the truck in motion. Um, so that's some of the things they're doing now. And the LIE and other places, they're actually using it for electronic tolling. Um, but the really interesting uses of this are, are in the future. So further on, when this becomes more ubiquitous in cars, what it'll be able to do is it'll be able to, um, by audibly or visually, by flashing lights and such, uh, warn you if you are too close to something like a guardrail or another car or another car is in your blind spot or an ambulance is trying to come through or other first responder vehicle that will alert you. Um, Further down the road, when uh, driverless cars, cars become somewhat ubiquitous, the idea with the platooning that Brad, uh, Brad mentioned is that, so <clears throat> you would feel uncomfortable, I'm sure, driving three inches off the bumper of the car in front of you. Uh, unless you're from New Jersey, then it's normal. Um, <laughs> that be as it may, um, 
but a, a, a computer, uh, you know, hopefully, if you trust it, would not be. Uh, and the idea between that is, is, is twofold. So if you're able to have a bunch of cars driving in one big cluster, a platoon, if you will, in formation, um, they're able to alleviate traffic because you don't have cars driving at, at different speeds. And also, because of the aerodynamics of the uh, air being broken by the cars in the front, flowing over the top of the entire uh, column, if you will, and down the back. So things like this are looked at for the future. I believe in the uh, Google driverless car. Um, implements some uh, measures of DSRC. So, things yeah, to come. It's pretty, really, I mean, to me, it's super interesting stuff, especially since you're dealing with vehicles in motion and there's a serious risk of, you know, loss of life there if, if there's some bad vulnerabilities there. So, it's very interesting to me. Um, if, the first oh, step God, in <laughs> the first step in looking up uh, kind of any network and to see what's available is to kind of do a little bit of reconnaissance. So um, we'll talk about a couple of uh, resources online that you can kind of uh, find areas um, where you know you can identify is there 4.9 gigahertz or is any of these public safety spectrums uh, in use in your area. Uh, so any ham radio person would know radio reference. Um, basically, question. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, everybody knows about radio, radio Reference. It's a great resource online. Um, if you want to see what's being used, just kind of, um, you know, uh, look for your local area. You can see uh, whether or not uh, anything's existing kind of in the 800 megahertz or the 700 megahertz spectrum, um, and it'll give you some information about that. Uh, probably something that a lot of people don't know about is CAPRAD. And CAPRAD, uh, when they were initially trying to figure out who's going to use what spectrum, um, you know, what uh, areas of public safety, um, what they did was they instructed a lot of people to go to this online resource called CAPRAD. And ideally what people would do is they'd say, okay, I'm using um, 700 megahertz in my town. You know, a municipality would go there, a regional planning committee would go there and say, I'm using uh, 700 megahertz in my town. This is where I'm using it for. This is what I'm using it for. And then everybody else can kind of look and see how each other's, how everybody else is using it, other municipalities, and then they can plan things around that. Um, but it wasn't really, uh, it's used a little bit for 700 and 800 megahertz, not really too much for 4.9 and 5. Um, and it requires actual uh, registration, but it's yeah. kind of easy to get access to it uh, if you just ask the guy, like, hey, give me an account, and he'll just create you one. So it's okay. So the idea, we basically, what you, whatever you, get, you can get through there through guest access is pretty much what you'd get with an account anyway, or a regular level account. Um, the, the idea was initially that, the, or it was supposed to be in theory, that the, these municipalities will be able to plan through the regional planning committees not to step on each other um, using these, these frequencies so that you'd know where you, it'll tell you where all the different transmitters are, what radius they're, uh, you know, uh, registered for and such. Uh, it is pretty useful for 700 and 800 megahertz. Um, you'll find a number of sites there. Uh, it's really not too much what you couldn't get through the FCC site, but well, some of the nice things in there is you can download a lot of the, your local um, 700 and 800 megahertz uh, frequencies and channels in spreadsheet format. Um, so it's, it's pretty quick and dirty for those, but as Brad said, for 4.9 and 5.9, it's uh, really just a pass through to the FCC site. Yeah, and so the probably the biggest help uh, in finding these kind of different networks is just your standard FCC license search. So you can define a specific channel, uh, a frequency range that when you use. So here we're uh, providing 4.940 uh, to 4.990. Uh, and that will give us kind of all of the things that are existing in that spectrum that we're looking for. Um, it returns some really good information uh, from you. Uh, sometimes the people are filling out the, um, the Form forms. a little more completely than they needed to. Yeah, they, they tend to be a, a kind of a, a little bit more uh, verbose than they probably have to be with that. Um, but it also tell you, if you look uh, down on the bottom there, if it's a mobile or, or a fixed um, uh, a, f a fixed usage, so this way you know, all right, well, if they plan on using it potentially for uh, police in a police car and they go to a spot, um, then you probably won't be able to pick it up through standard war driving, but if it's a, if it's a, a fixed area, you know kind of where to go. Um, and then... If you want to go to the next slide, I just want to yeah. cover a couple things. And then after that, it'll actually tell you the different frequency ranges that are allocated. And this is hugely Very helpful huge. Um, for you to figure out uh, if... Um, what channel usages they're using, right? So you can get an idea if, if they have one allocation for 4.950 uh, 4 
and then the next allocation is for 4.960. You can take a, take a pretty good guess that they're using 10 megahertz wide channels and where those channels start and end. Probably. The, the, the biggest thing is definitely you want to you know the channel centers so that you can lock on to them. Uh, generally, like, like Brad said, you can kind of figure that's probably 10 megahertz wide channels. Sometimes there's a lot of different uh, recommendations in terms of channel um, cha you know, the channel overlap. Um, so it may not always be the case, and different manufacturers do things differently also. Uh, but we'll, as we'll see in a minute, sometimes there's ways to be able to tell what sort of equipment they're using as well. Um, a couple things about this as well. So some, there's many records in there. You can search for the 4940 to 4990 frequency range, and you can search for your particular area. It'll show you all the sites for any particular, you know, town or city in there. Uh, what I found generally is the more information they have in their records there now just because they have a license doesn't mean they definitely have an implementation yeah it almost seemed mm -hmm. like like a, a, a dick measuring contest between municipalities like oh did you get your license yeah I did because we would have you know everybody would have licenses and we'd be driving around aimlessly looking for stuff yeah, and couldn't find anything we'd search the internet I mean it's so, kind of ridiculous so I think people we, are just grabbing in the grab so we chased some geese in Jersey definitely with that yeah. um, New Jersey so a couple of Jersey, different, couple yeah. things yeah quite <laughs> <laughs> um, so, a couple different things there. Um, it, it, Jersey had a lot of different licenses listed out, but most of them didn't seem to have implementations, or if they did, they were mostly point-to-point -point links, which you'd have to get in the middle of to try to get any, uh, any, any semblance of, of, of a signal. Uh, whereas New York City, um, much better because of the, the sites being much lower, being camera mounted on cameras and such. Uh, so much better luck there. Uh, but a couple of things. So it generally would seem like the more information is in their record, the more likelihood there will be a particular site there before you go driving 20, 30 miles to try to, uh, you know, war drive it. Uh, but that's not always the case. Um, for instance, uh, sometimes you'll see in there it'll say citywide license. Uh, or as Brad was saying, they're uh, mobile, right? Uh, it, it'll just have one license for the entire city, uh, like Las Vegas had this, uh, for instance. But Las Vegas, we found, had an implementation uh, and a pretty significant one. Uh, whereas some of the towns in New Jersey that had all these different channels listed out uh, appeared to have nothing. So it's not always, you know, yeah. it, it's not an exact science always. And sometimes it's kind of cool, they'll actually give you GPS coordinates so you know exactly where to go if you want to find 4.9 gigahertz. Um, but uh, definitely uh, one of the obvious uh, huge resources to look up is 4.9 gigahertz plus any town name or uh, you know uh, police department name or anything like that. So here we uh, looked up the NYPD with 4.9 gigahertz, and a lot of these when a lot of these. Uh, um, when they want to request Vendors. a license, basically, uh, they'll actually request the FCC and write a pretty detailed uh, letter to them. And so somehow these things manage their way on the internet, and so you can they're, you can see what they're using them for and and how they. They're actually on hosted on the DHS site, and and moreover beyond that, uh, what happens generally is when any vendor uh, does an implementation for a given municipality, uh, they're more than happy to trumpet it all over the internet. You know, such and such did. Impl you know, they on their PR newswire and everything did implementation for such town using such equipment and sometimes such channels and uh, yeah, they get a little verbose about it. Yeah. So that's always helpful as well. So I don't I don't see the the next the showdown slides there. So yeah, it looks like we lost some slides in the ether. Uh, maybe you can just talk to it real quick. Uh, okay. Um, so unfortunately, for some reason, I don't know why that deck came up like that. Um, okay, a couple other ways to to uh, define things. Um, Number one, um, I, I was going to show you the actual letter there from the NYPD, um, but there it lists out in it the channels that they were using, um, you know, channels 6, 7, uh, 9, 11, 9, 10, and, and uh, 11, uh, uh, 10 through 13, I believe, um, which will tell you what, you know, generally what center frequencies they are using. Um, furthermore, they didn't say what kind of equipment they were using, but they did say uh, they give the FCC ID of the uh, of the equipment. Now you can look up the FCC identifier of any uh, given piece of uh, equipment if you have the ID on the FCC site. And what I found was that it was a Cisco uh, 3200. So that's another way of being able to look up what kind of equipment they have, which will give you more information on their implementation. Uh, okay, so a, a couple of the ways of looking things up as well. Um, Wiggle.net. Uh, you guys familiar with Wiggle? The wireless uh, in a geographic loca locating engine. Um, so that works, you know, generally for 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. How is that going to help me with 4.9, you might ask? Well, the, the, there's a lot of equipment like Motorola's uh, um, Moto Mesh Quattro that uses is dual band. Uh, so it does 2.4 and 4.9 gigahertz. 
and it has a unique uh, SSID if it's using the um, <coughs> what do you call it the uh, the default SSID, which is Moto Mesh. So in which case you can look up the SSID of Moto Mesh, find where that is located geographically, and there's a good chance that where there is a 2.4 gigahertz implementation, there will be a 4.9. Uh, which was what I found in Las Vegas. Yeah, it's pretty surprising how how many of these. I mean, I guess it's a thing that, as a security person, I should know by now. But it, it doesn't cease to amaze me um, how many of these networks, even though they're on 4.9, they're clear land specialized equipment. They're still using default SSIDs, really weak configuration and, and security settings. And we'll talk a little bit about them in the next upcoming slides. So one more uh, way of finding a dance partner, as it was, um, is um, Shodan. Are you guys familiar with Shodan? So Shodan is uh, a, uh, what's the way to put it, it is a search engine for machines, for systems. Um, whereas Google helps you find web pages or web servers, Shodan will uh, help you, you can search for any other number of services like SSH and Telnet and uh, SNMP and, and pretty much any text string that's outputted by them. Um, so if you go to Shodan, uh, or you download their, uh, there's a, a plugin in Metasploit or there's a, a, a plugin for, the, for Firefox. Um, you can put in, for instance, in my case, I just searched for 4.9 gigahertz. Uh, and what I found was a bunch of Trazio um, access points, a Trazio TR49, if I remember correctly, uh, which are APs that are only do 4.9 gigahertz. They're made specifically for 4.9. Uh, and I found uh, a number of those, some located in Haiti, some located in California, um, used by a couple, uh, a couple different uh, wireless ISPs. Um, I was also able to find um, uh, equipment from, I'm trying to think of the other manufacturer, uh, Infinite, I believe it was, or um, I don't recall. I wish I had my slide. Um, but the, the idea is, so you can either search for you know, something like as simple as 4.9, or you can search for um, things like, um, you could search for um, pieces of equipment um, like Motorola uh, 4900 series or any other um, known uh, 4.9 gigahertz controllers. Uh, and if um, Shodan has found them when scanning SNMP uh, and it disclosed that information, you'll then be able to find them there. And generally, you'll also be able to tell, um, based on what Shodan gives you for information on the IP, where they're located uh, geographically. So that's another good way of looking at it. All right, so now that you've found uh, certain areas of 4.9 uh, implementations and stuff, uh, we wanted to figure out, all right, how do we interact with these, these access points? Um, you know, how, how do we even like, start to mess around with them? So uh, first thing when you mess around with any hardware is just search Google. Um, and so we found a whole crap load of 4.9 gigahertz uh, stuff on Google um, for varying prices. So uh, we went out and tried to buy them. But it turns out the internet is full of a lot of people who don't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, because uh, when you would go and contact these people and buy them, some of these guys, especially the guy on the bottom, uh, he really sucked. I actually bought that. He shipped it from the UK, and it didn't have a 4.9 gigahertz radio in it. Um, so like a lot of these guys, like, they don't know where the, like, what they're getting or what they're selling, and they just kind of look up some obscure model number and come to a conclusion that they're using it. Um, so that kind of sucked a lot, uh, but there was actually some good benefits of things. Um, I came across this access point, and living in New York, it looked a little familiar to me. Um, all throughout New York, there's a number of these security cameras kind of all over the place. It's a little dark here, uh, but if you focus right on the top area, uh, you'll see a kind of a familiar shape there, and that's actually the same access point that the NYPD uses as part of their uh, video mesh network. Um, so I picked up one of those. It was only 100 bucks. It's normally 1000 uh, I still don't know why it's so cheap. I guess somebody stole it. I, I have no idea. Um, but I was pretty happy to pick that up uh, and just kind of start playing around with it. Um, another interesting thing, when we were searching around and trying to find different hardware that exists, uh, we came across this uh, forum post on Ubiquiti's forums. So Ubiquiti is an access point or just kind of a general wireless manufacturer. They make a lot of different hardware uh, for different things. And um, there's just this kind of random post from 2010 where this guy's like, hey, I want to use this certain Ubiquiti access point uh, in the 4.9 gigahertz spectrum. How do I do it? And so the response back uh, is, oh, just go to the wireless menu and change to compliance test mode. And so that appealed to me immediately. So we quickly went and bought one of those things. Um, but what we, it turned out was the one that we bought um, was, an, uh, so the model number is an NSM5. Uh, and the model number we bought was an NSM5-US. 
And it didn't have this compliance test mode. So I was like getting old versions of the firmware, trying to figure out what was going on, uh, trying to figure out. And actually, Rob figured out in May of 2011. It's um, slide. Let me, I'll take it. Well, so in May of 2011, uh, actually, uh, Ubiquity is kind of slapped on the wrist a little bit, um, a, a little bit before that, uh, because there was kind of uh, certain uh, cases so, where people were using Ubiquity equipment um, in ranges that weren't permitted. And so Ubiquity actually still supports this compliance test mode, but they just didn't include it in the U.S. version. They had created another version called the world version. So, uh, so we um, bought one of those. So basically, um, Ubiquity um, uses uh, Theros chipsets in a lot of their uh, a lot of their equipment. And uh, Theros, as we're going to see in a minute, um, you're able to uh, unlock the chipset. It's not. F it, it has a capability of being able to do from four gigahertz to six gigahertz, uh, and it's only really prevented by doing that, uh, preventing from doing that in the driver as we'll see in a minute. Um, and so wireless ISPs, and a lot of people seem to like to use their, their APs, uh, and utilize them uh, either purposefully or not uh, outside of what the accepted spectrum is. Um, so they got a, a few wireless ISPs. I saw one in, when I was looking on the FCC site uh, on the complaints uh, section uh, where they keep public records of complaints. One in Miami, one in Puerto Rico, one in Utah that I can think of. Um, all near, what happened was um, they were having issues uh, near airports with the terminal Doppler weather radar. Um, there's something known as d dynamically frequent, dynamic frequency selection in, on 5 gigahertz chipsets, which basically uh, around 5.6 gigahertz or so, uh, I believe it is, there is uh, the terminal Doppler weather radar operates in that space. And in order to be able to use a chipset that works it's near that you have to have this dynamic frequency selection so that you don't interfere with, uh, with that Doppler radar. Anyway, these guys, uh, at least in a couple cases, disabled it. Uh, and uh, so far, and, and in doing so, interfered with the Doppler weather radar. FCC uh, didn't like that very much and spanked them accordingly. So there was enough instances of this happening and in the same time frame that I gather that Ubiquity caught some flack also from the FCC. And as a result of that, they released two versions now of these APs. They have a U.S. version and a world version. And to buy the world version, you need to sign something stating that you have a, uh, or have a license uh, in the U.S. Yeah, so when I, was, when I was going to go try to buy this world version, because I had to go on a hunt for it now, because uh, it wasn't in immediately clear, I found this kind of shady online retailer that looked like they had a site from 1990 or so. And I saw that they had one. And uh, I bought it, and the guy's like, hey, man, listen, I forgot to ask you, but you have to sign this uh, paper uh, because uh, recently Ubiquity's been getting in a little bit of trouble. I, I need you to sign this. This basically says you have an FCC license. Uh, so I was like, uh, no. And he was like, no, come on, man. You know, I'm sorry. I know it has. I'm like, I need this immediately. No. And uh, he sent it to me. <laughs> so, yeah, that worked out pretty well. Um, so... so uh, as far as adapters go, so now we have some access points that we can play around with and see, um, you know, see what these networks are like. Uh, obviously, we were only using those access points in a Faraday cage in another country that supports uh, 4.9 uh, generally. Yeah, oh, yeah. Disclaimer. Um, but yes, Jersey is another country. We bought a um, lot of tinfoil. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so you need some adapters to play with. So if you start Googling these adapters, 4.9 gigahertz, the first one you come up with, too, is the Ubiquity SR4C. Um, this looks like a great adapter, but the problem is if you want to use it in Linux, um, the drivers don't actually support it. Uh, so it's kind of a pain in the butt, um, so you have to kind of look at other options. Uh, so the other thing that we had, if you do any wireless hacking, you've come across this card before. It's kind of like... Uh, to me, it's the best card ever because it supports a lot of different frequency spectrums um, and does a lot of, uh, has like uh, different antenna outputs, it's a, and it's a pretty powerful card. It's a Ubiquity SRC300. Um, so it looks like a good card and everything, uh, but you know, by default, it, it doesn't always, say, it doesn't clearly say uh, what the range is, um, what the range that it supports is. Uh, so this guy Kugitsuman um, actually found out that that card supports everywhere from. 4.910 to 6100 megahertz. So that's both 4.9 gigahertz, uh, your standard 802.11a type stuff, and uh, even that 5.9 gigahertz stuff. Um, but Ubiquity doesn't want to tell you that because I'm sure they'll get a big slap on the wrist from the FCC. Uh, so and, and don't set it 
over uh, uh, six gig. If you set it above that, you will fry the card. Yeah. <laughs> They're not very well tested. Be careful with that stuff. Uh, so this guy, Kugitsuma, was like, oh, man, this is amazing, um, and actually wrote a debug patch for the drivers. Because again, the biggest problem here is even though the hardware supported it, the drivers in Linux didn't support it. Um, so he wrote this debug patch. Um, and this was a little while ago, and, and it's no longer supported in the newest stuff. So his patch was for Mad Wi-Fi. Uh, the kind of current uh, 811 stack in Linux is com um, uh, Compat Wireless. Um, go ahead. Um, no, it's yeah. not a software-defined radio. All the radio equipment is in the card, right. so it deals with the modulation. It's a, it's a standard 802.11 uh, yeah. VG uh, card. Yeah, you could. Uh, yeah, I, that, I guess that's a good question that a lot of people ask us about this talk. Is um, why not just use a, a software-defined radio to do all this stuff? You, it's kind of free as 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 you want to play with it. The thing is, uh, certain software-defined radios can be really expensive, especially when it gets up into that frequency range. And this is an off-the-shelf card you can pick up um, all over the place. Uh, and we'll show you that you can use it to, to play around with stuff. Um, so some other people did some, uh, made some other patches to try to get this to work, um, or at least expand it. They weren't necessarily targeting 4.9. Uh, so Zero Chaos actually wrote a patch for it. Um, again, this is older. It no longer works, but, uh, and it doesn't support different channel widths. And remember, channel widths was a big thing on 4.9 gigahertz uh, because they can change them. They can be 10 megahertz, you know, 5 megahertz, a couple of different things. Um, this other guy, Spench, who is the, uh, like an internet rock star to me, uh, he makes, like every time I get interested in anything, I found out Spench has did some work on this stuff. Uh, so that guy, I owe him a lot of beers. Um, but he actually cr wrote this crazy patch for this thing to make it work with radar systems. Um, and like, you know, it was just a crazily intense patch. Um, it did do some of the stuff, but it was way too complex and it, it was like overkill to, to, for, for what we needed. And it was old. It was written for an older set of drivers. Um, so we had to start looking at Compact Wireless and saying, all right, well, how can we modify these drivers to work the way we want to uh, and, and, and um, be able to operate in this 4.9 gigahertz spectrum. Um, so the way Compact Wireless works is it has this main kind of regulatory module here. And it queries the adapter itself. Um, and in the EEPROM is actually uh, hardwired the regulatory domain in which the card should operate. So um, the Compact Wireless queries it says, where should you operate? It'll say, I should operate in the US. It says, OK, fine. Um, and then it looks up in one of two places. Uh, it tries to determine what is the channel lists that are applicable to that regulatory domain. So in Japan, their channel list is going to be drastically different or somewhat different than us, our channel list in the US. And in some frequencies on Japan um, would be uh, regulated by the FCC here. Uh, so you want to make sure that, you know, wherever the card's transmitting, uh, it doesn't uh, break any laws. Um, so uh, it goes to one of two spots. It goes to these uh, built-in driver definitions or this CRDA, this um, a central register domain agent. It's basically a user land daemon that queries this other little database for all of the information. Um, so uh, what we did was we kind of modified things a little bit in the regulatory module um, and also uh, in this regulatory database. So it returned back 4.9 gigahertz channels as well. Um, there was this uh, little um, a function here. It's IW reg set. And it, the idea behind it is if you were in Japan and you went to the U.S., um, you should be able to change your car's regulatory domain so that you don't mess up. It never uh, works. Yeah, but it just doesn't work. It's like a, they, it's uh, like a, a no there function. Was, there was a number stupid. of patches a few years ago that were um, uh, based, uh, were created just to make that actually work, to be able to uh, allow it that, you know, make that, um, uh, 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 what do you call it? What's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, hmm? Yes, yeah, something of that <laughs> nature. Uh, basically, j just to be able to honor you setting a, a, a setting with it, um, but that doesn't work anymore either. All right, so what we had to do is take a look at the drivers, um, and it, we did some really intense hacking for this one. Um, basically, we looked through the drivers and found this lovely function: is 4.9 gigahertz uh, allowed? Uh, and said, okay, well, w we we followed it down a little bit and changed the code uh, just a little bit. And now 4.9 gigahertz is always allowed for kind of all of the, all the drivers. It's pretty, pretty intense hacking. Uh, the other problem uh, was those different channel widths. 
And so with our, the channel widths, that was actually a little bit more work. We had to read basically uh, five or six lines of, uh, of commented code. And basically somebody said, hey, look, uh, I know somebody's going to want to do this in the future. I'm too lazy to do this now. Uh, these are the things that you should do to make it work. So we had to write a couple more lines of code, um, and uh, all the drivers now support it. So um, what you do is uh, basically you have to uh, compile these drivers. Um, the specific modules for your system have one of those ubiquity cards. Um, and it's really simple. You just do a mod probe to the driver and define the channel width that you want to use. Um, and you can use any channel width that you want to do it. The, you can't do dynamic channel widths, um, uh, but you can, do, uh, you can set them uh, at, at module load time. Um, so to do the actual install, I created a really quick script. Uh, just go to Open Security Research on uh, GitHub and just run this, and it works. Um, actually, like two nights ago, I, I, you know, I wanted to test everything out and just ran the script. I lost all the stuff that I was working on before, and it actually worked. So I can say it actually works. Um, and then uh, to, to set everything up, you can, you can set your uh, bandwidth mode, just set up a mounted remote interface, determine, define your frequency, and then you can just use TCP dump or Wireshark um, or e even Kismet. Um, so we were talking about that database that defines all of the channels. Uh, so on the GitHub, we have these kind of configuration files here. This configuration file will just say, in the US, we support uh, basically 4.910 to 6100. Um, and it'll auto always uh, support that uh, forever. Um, when you want to use Kismet, uh, you have to define some channel lists. Like Dragorn is the coolest guy if you've ever interacted with him. He's super nice. He's the uh, author of Kismet. Um, and basically, the way he wrote Kismet was that he just takes whatever the hardware tells it. So we're telling the hardware to do stuff already. So we just tell, um, uh, tell uh, Kismet just a little bit about it. And we can define our channel lists however we want and do all that stuff. And we can sniff on it really easily with Kismet. Yeah, this is why it's important you have to know what the channel centers are that a given, uh, given implementation is using uh, and the channel widths so that you can define them appropriately. All right, and then you also have to buy an antenna. Um, that's not too hard to find. You can search online a little bit. You'll find one on, on all your kind of standard places. Whatever hyperlink is now called, I always forget. Um, uh, WLANparts.com, yeah. 20 bucks. It's Pasadena yeah. Networks. Sorry, I'm getting too close to the mic here. <laughs> um, <laughs> it reminds me of that Fight Club episode. Where she, she, at the end, she's like, I really want to have sex. Like, <laughs> <sorry>. <laughs> All right, anyway, so we, get, we had this adapter. We were super excited. We were jumping up and down. We can sniff 4.9 gigahertz. Everything worked. So we jumped over to New Jersey where all of the fun happens, and we drove around for days, man. It sucked. Yeah. Um, we were stuck in traffic. We created traffic. It was the amazing. Hottest day of the year. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was really good. The the what was messing with us is we kept seeing these freaking antennas all over the place, and we just at one point we got brazen. We would just drive up to an antenna, and it, like some of them were low hanging, so we just drive up and just sit in he the front stood facing on the, roof the antenna. Of the car with a panel antenna. It, there was. And it's like an, the area is like an, like you, you get off the parkway and it's like a rest stop. So like there's, there's traffic coming. We're standing on the roof and, the and there's police, traffic passing the us. State police and barracks next door. Yeah, we were pretty brazen because we were just getting so pissed off it. Well, if we did just a little bit more research, we would have discovered that um, actually, uh, even though Jersey uses 4.9 gigahertz, they primarily use it for YMAX, which our 802.11 adapters wouldn't have picked up. Um, so we wasted a lot, of, a lot of days for that. But we learned uh, Google and all of those FCC license search and all that stuff is really your friends and uh, to not ignore that reconnaissance step. Um, so the next thing, since I live in New York City, um, I jumped on my bicycle, uh, made, made a list of precinct maps, which I, like, I was just driving around on my bike. War and, pedaling. Well, I was literally, I was war pedaling. But the problem is, is I'm riding around on my bike and I have a list, of, like a Google Maps outline of all of the precincts. And I have this like computer with this antenna out of my backpack. And if any cop would have stopped me, man, they would have just like I would have been like immediate terrorist, I, I, just because it looked so shady to me. Um, but they have this whole uh, crazy mesh network um, with again the, here's that other picture we're showing. Um, and uh, so I was trying to figure out you know what's what's the deal with them, how are they being used, uh, and I came across a lot of this stuff, um, these constant probe requests that constantly came out over and over again. Um, I masked out the SSIDs uh, to try to be as nice as I could to them. 
Um, but a lot of them were default, so there were actually a lot of default SSIDs. The messed up thing is I never actually saw data coming over any of this stuff. It was only management frames, which is really interesting to me. Um, I, I met this other dude, and he said that these things are used on demand. So a cop like uh, uh, gets to a scene, sees that there's a camera, sends some sort of like activate you know Megatron now, and that thing turns on and starts watching, and he can get a feed off of that. I don't really know how it works, um, but even like. I, Ever since Hurricane Sandy happened, York, there's been lights. Like normally on these things, they're just all dark, right? But as soon as Hurricane Sandy started, there's been these green and red lights flashing on them. So I thought that maybe like they were all activated, but still I couldn't get any data out of it. Nothing was there. So this is another case where there's default SSIDs in use too, right? And uh, if I remember correctly, this is dual band equipment. So it's another case of where. Oh, no, you know, this isn't dual band. This wasn't dual no, band? No. All right. But, but the stuff we'll talk about. Uh, yeah, no, we'll talk about the other thing. So I, and then, so I was going to station to station, and again, I just started getting brazen. I would just stop my bicycle across the street from a police department, um, open up, point the antenna at them, and just, like, and sometimes it was like the middle of the night, like 2 a.m. Like, what, why am I there, you know? And like, so, like cops would look at me, like, walk by and be like, uh, I don't know, he's not smoking crack, you know? So, I, I mean, I don't know. I figure they seem to, they always seem to be heightened over there. They should have really punched me in the face or done something, but they didn't. Um, but randomly, uh, I didn't get too much from the stations, but I did come across this. Um, and I was like, oh, this looks good. And then I started to notice that they're actually using Leap uh, for their 80211 handshake on here. Um, so that's a big problem. I, I, you know, uh, I don't know if too many people are familiar with 802.11 security, so. but basically Leap s transmits a challenge and response in plain text over the air. Um, so it uses if, MS Chat V2 uh, in the it, yeah, it, yeah. In, in the clear. So it's no good. I didn't want to mess around with that because I didn't want to get kicked in the balls, um, or you know, I don't want to wake up to a morning raid or anything like that. So I, I kind of moved it. Go. Um, yeah, well, so well, 802.11, yeah. no, no, so 802.11, yeah. Enterprise yeah. and other versions, so they use 802.11x underneath you have, you for have the a, different EAP. You yeah. have a number of different EAP types, right? You can have PEEP, LEAP, EAP TLS, you know, EAP TTLS. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, it's, on 802.11, It's, it's yeah. common a lot of places, I gotta yeah. say. Un oh, yeah, but the, the unfortunate thing about it, you know, is that, you know, LEAP passes that handshake in the clear with no sort of TLS tunnel or any kind of pretension to try to protect it. Um, and as of DEF CON this year, uh, with um, uh, Moxie and uh, Hikari's research, um, you know, now pretty much any MS Chap V2 handshake can be cracked within, what do you think you say, 24 hours? Yeah, so there is, uh, the way that cracking uh, these handshakes uh, happens, it, the way that they've been brute forcing them has been kind of uh, not very optimized. And so Moxie uh, actually gave a talk and uh, Hikura gave a talk um, at DEF CON showing a very much more optimized way to crack those passwords. And they said they can crack them in 24 hours. Um, so that's really scary to think that the NYPD is using something that can be cracked in 24 hours um, on this network. And it just makes me think like, all right, well, maybe they just ha feel like there's this implied level of security because it's on this 4.9 uh, gigahertz spectrum. You know, I, I don't know. Um, the other thing that we noticed was those cameras, and they were only you know, transmitting those management frames. Um, we were wondering if that was um, uh, Proxim's wireless outdoor routing protocol. They have this very proprietary um, mesh network protocol that operates uh, 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 you know, um, on a mesh network. It's like and a modified 802.11. Yeah, it, like older versions, you can do some hacks with it, but the newer versions, you can't really do too much. So we couldn't play around with too much. Um, and I, at that point, I didn't feel comfortable continuing on because I thought that one might be more of a targeted attack against them. And I, I don't want to start targeting them or, or even get into the realm where I you might know, be kicking them That the gets into that. the whole modifying thing that the uh, EFF warned us about. But you know, the yeah. older versions, you can remove the uh, frame check sequence. Uh, and because it's a sort of modified 802.11 protocol, uh, if you do that, you're able to, uh, able to read the traffic. Uh, yeah. Newer versions, and they're not quite so lucky. But, uh. So uh, when we were in Vegas, we said, all right, well, no better time than now. So we started to look at uh, to Las Vegas, and we found some kind of so interesting things. What happened was uh, I went up to my room. Uh, we were teaching a class in Vegas uh, at Black Hat, and I went up to my room, and I just, uh, flipped on the vi wireless. I was just kind of you know, checking through the uh, 2.4 gigahertz. I had my alpha card out on my desk, and I see this Moto Mesh SSID. I'm like, Moto Mesh? And I'm like, I know it's Motorola equipment, and I'm like, 
that likely is a dual band uh, uh, radio. Um, you know, either it's probably their Moto Mesh Quattro or, or variant. Um, so I immediately, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I, uh, I immediately call, call Brad and break Brad. I think we might have something here. Um, because he was asking me, he's like, do you, do you think there's any 4.9 in Vegas? I'm like, well, they got a citywide license. You know, I don't know. We were actually going to go drive out to the outskirts where there was defined sites. Um, but anyway, I call him. I'm like, dude, we, we got to go check this out. So we go grab a, uh, a laptop. Yeah, I put and, on my uh, pants and we, we went as fast as we, we could. Uh, we're walking up and down the Vegas Strip with a, uh, a laptop. And then what, but what we started to see is, you know, like when you see one ant, you start to see like 15,000. So as soon as we started to look around, we're like, holy shit, man. Look at this. All of these, all, all of these poles have all of these antennas on them, and there's all of this crap. Every oh my god, we're in 4.9 gigahertz, fucking heaven, man. This is amazing. So we, we like went nuts, started up our sniffer, and we started finding all types of kind of interesting stuff. Um, so the first thing we found was this Moto Mesh network, um, and as Rob was saying, there's this with the Moto Mesh network. It's kind of interesting. They have two um, uh, two different radios, and so what they do is they'll is use two? one radio and no. yeah, the three, actually four. Oh yeah, four right, on yeah. two different bands. Right. There's a, it operates on the 2.4 and 4.9 gigahertz spectrums, but there's four radios. So. Two of them will be 802.11 compliant, uh, one on, um, uh, on the 4.9 gigahertz spectrum and one on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. Uh, the other two uh, are Motorola uh, Mobility Enhanced Access, uh, the uh, Motorola MEA, which is a proprietary uh, mesh protocol, and there'll be one of each on each spectrum there too. Uh, MEA's big thing is that it's, it's, it's mesh optimized, uh, and, and so basically it's good for, like for instance, uh, you know, a cop car uh, zooming by a fixed AP at you know 90 miles an hour, uh, it's optimized for that sort of thing, and also it has a sort of like um, a GPS capability where basically it can tell where a given unit is, uh, say a police car unit, um, based by on uh, what route the last packets took from it. So things like that. Um, there's other solutions that do that sort of thing, but basically that's one of the more you know enhanced mesh. Uh, offerings, I suppose. Yeah, but the kind of interesting thing about it is because it has those two different, well, the 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 4.9 and the 2.4 um, radios on them. Um, what they do is, if one's more crowded than the other, it'll just switch over and use the other one. But now you're giving two methods of access. So 4.9 might have been somewhat protected because there's this kind of uh, entry gap to get access to it. But it's also offered on 2.4. Um, so once we started seeing 2.4, we turned on our 4.9 antennas, and sure enough, we were seeing it there as well. Um, so that was really interesting. Problem again with that is very similar to New York in that um, we only saw um, uh, very kind of specific frames there, uh, and most of the frames were all management frames. Every once in a while, we'd see this other thing, uh, but most of it was all management frames. Our only guess, again, was that they're, they're on-demand um, uh, uh, cameras and stuff Snap like that. Snap frames, uh, spanning tree, D you know, DHCP, stuff like that. So yeah. thinking that the majority of the traffic uh, was traversing the uh, MEA network. Yeah, yeah, and then, well, we started to dig on into a little bit, and there was these kind of, like, odd, um, there was kind of these, uh, these other odd frames that were jumping around a little bit on us, so we started to dig into them. Um, Wireshark couldn't really pick out what they were, um, but if you dig down, it looked like to be some sort of a advertisement frame, uh, but again, we really wanted to be careful. Uh, we're really worried about legal. We didn't want to dive too much into it. Um, so the motor mesh, uh, mesh network, uh, like we talked about, uh, has a couple of different things. Um, but the, the cool identifier for that is if you search for 2.4 gigahertz um, with a standard adapter, if you see a motor mesh ID, it's almost always will have a 4.9 gigahertz uh, radio on it. But there's no even reason to look at that. Uh, and then, for whatever reason, um, the gods were shining uh, bright on Rob's room because we found this one other network that Rob uh, discovered in his room that was only in his room. Like, we couldn't find it anywhere else, and we were, like, moving up and down. It was ridiculous. We looked like idiots, like Ghostbusters running around. <laughs> I don't doubt it. Likely. <laughs> But yeah, so we started to dive into this other network. My only guess was is that it was some sort of point-to-point -point link, and we just so happened to be like we're giving a talk, at, you know, at DEF CON about hacking 4.9 gigahertz, and we're in the room that's 4.9 gigahertz is being sped like right into it. It was weird. So 
Yeah, it was kind of strange. So uh, we found that it, it turned out to be this sky pilot network, and we, I don't know shit about it. We, we looked it up. I think there was some point-to-point -point stuff, but we don't know what the hell it is. And we, again, we'll, we don't want to transmit on any of this stuff. We were just kind of observing and, and trying to be as general as we could. Um, so the, that's kind of everything that we found from war driving and looking around and seeing what's available. Um, there are definitely a lot of proprietary protocols, uh, so you're going to have to know your mesh networks and your point-to-point -point stuff if you want to look at a lot of it. Um, sometimes, uh, and obviously the channels is the biggest thing. You're, you're, you're going to do a lot of searching trying to find the different channels. All right, so uh, go ahead, one. Yeah. So in the process of, uh, of look, you know, doing research into this, um, I was wondering, you know, I was like, hey, you know, has there been any, uh, any attacks against, um, you know, 4.9 gigahertz uh, networks or public safety networks in general? Um, so I don't know if you guys remember, uh, this is a couple months before DEF CON, I guess, there was uh, this article all, all over the, you know, the InfoSec news sites uh, about a, a hacker that might have tar targeted uh, Lamont, Illinois, and another town nearby, um, a tornado sirens. Now, uh, tornado sirens are new to me, um, being from Jersey, but, you know, I was kind of looking at this a little bit, and I was like, you know, well, I, I do know that, you know, uh, that's one of the things that generally is ran, run over 4.9 gigahertz networks. Um, so I started doing a little digging into it, and uh, you can go ahead, one. And I saw that there was, uh, the, the, in one of the, one of the articles, uh, it, it, it stated that uh, Federal Signal uh, was uh, the vendor that was being, um, being uh, used there. Uh, that they had them correct the problem for whatever reason, whatever they had in, that was you know incorrect, they didn't specify. Um, but anyway, I looked into the PR Newswire a little bit and saw that Federal Signal, uh, who's a known manufacturer of uh, 4.9 gigahertz tornado siren systems, did in fact do their implementation and had a uh, public uh, relations uh, release about it. It's an interesting coincidence. Yeah. Um, so. What it did look like, by all accounts, is that there was a, uh, an, a, a attack over 4.9 gigahertz network. But I, but I, nobody would have ever seen that coming. I don't, I don't know where. Yeah, it's strange stuff. It, and and don't laugh. That was from two years ago. <laughs> but if if you Google tornado sirens, right, or how to it, Google something like you know, for instance, uh, tornado siren hack or tornado siren how to hack. There's a Google autocomplete will autocomplete it in a number of different ways. So it, 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 I'm not the only one suggesting for that. Uh, you know, uh, look searching for that. that really At any rate, it's awesome. All right, works. any questions, concerns, guys? <laughs> LTE. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it would. <laughs> yeah. Before somebody else buys them. Yeah, that, uh, I, that, yeah, that I have no idea, but it, it won't be available to us. I mean, it's going to be available to pu public safety, local law enforcement, those kind of people. Um, or, or is she talking about the Nextel conversion? No. Oh, no. The LTE. Yeah. Oh, she's, ta she's talking about the old Nextel spectrum that they, they, oh. that they were uh, going to be using LTE. I well, don't no, really I know for the sure. The old Nextel spectrum uh, they were going to use for P25. Well, no, they, so they moved. Okay, uh, so they, I guess they, they shuffled them around. Sure. When, when, okay, when, Next, when uh, Sprint bought uh, Nextel, they got their spectrum, the, uh, the rebanded spectrum, right? After yeah. it's been moved, Sprint was, uh, Nextel was promised some of the spectrum out of the interference range, right? Um, and they were using that for the ESMR stuff, for their click to talk, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they did away with all that now, and now they are going to be using that for LTE. Uh, whether they're going to be successful in that endeavor, uh, you mm -hmm. know, they got they were allowed to do it, which was interesting. The government, the FCC, allowed them to do it. Uh, so I don't know. Somebody got lobbied correctly, I suppose. Any other questions? All right, cool guys. Oh, in the back. It, it would be um, the equivalent it, of like well, 802.11a. See, the, the, but uh, the closest thing likely would yeah. probably be 802.11j. But that's not really well, no, a standard. It, it's so much of a frequency or in channel range. I, it, I, it's using there's, OFDM. There's, it's using well, OFDM, and the yeah. thing is, it's not so 802.11a so also it, defines it, the frequency it spectrum. It uses that OFDM it just in. like 802.11a does, but there's no standard for it per se. 
Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The only out of all of this, the only thing that actually has a standard was the DSR, the uh, 5.9 gigahertz we're talking about. That's uh, 802.11p, um, which is the IEEE 1609, I think, uh, standard. Um, it's wireless access in vehicular environments, but that's the only one that's actually standards based. Yeah, no worries. So, it's a, it has an Atheros chipset, and uh, the those particular uh, Atheros chipsets are um, able to be opened up from uh, four gigahertz to uh, sixty one hundred or six, you know, a little over six gigahertz. There's a number of uh, Atheros chipsets that uh, yeah, they're able to. Well, well, okay. So, all right. So the, the modifications we made were to the Ath five K driver, which is used for that uh, the SRC three hundred. In, in theory, you know, we didn't make this modification, but in theory, it shouldn't be too difficult to make the same modifications to the Ath 9K driver, which is used with the um, Ubiquiti SR71C card. It shouldn't be too much difference there at all, I would suppose. I, I think there's something very specific in, in that, that model number of the Ethereum chipset. Um, so I know like the Netgear WAG 511 has the same, uh, it uses the same Ath 5K drivers, but I don't think that that chipset's yeah, the radio is a little different. So I think you would have to, I, I, I don't know, but you have to research though that ex specific one. Uh, yeah. there, there probably is other ones that could be, uh, could be used, but... Uh. Yeah, I tried it on two. <laughs> well, any other questions? All right, cool, guys. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, guys, we've had a scheduling conflict, so we're going to have to be out of here for a full hour at least. And uh, everybody needs to go ahead and clear out if that's okay. So. All I want is more beer. It probably wouldn't be too difficult. The thing is, this whole, this whole like round yeah. is so touchy yeah. that 